There we go. Curtains up. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the October meeting of Manhattan Community Board 4. My name is Jeffrey LeFrancois, and I'm chair of the board, and it's a pleasure to call the meeting to order this evening. Um, we are back on the squares holding this um, meeting by order of the governor, uh, by order of the executive order. Um, the meeting is being live streamed this evening and will be made available on our YouTube channel uh, and is accessible by the public. Uh, a few things in advance of our, our agenda this evening. Um, we have a presentation. We've been joined by the captain from the 10th precinct this evening. Um, and we'll also have a hearing on the statement of district needs and budget requests. And then as is our custom, we'll have public session when members of the public who have signed up to speak in advance will be given the ability to speak during that time. Um, if you did not sign up through our website to speak in advance, you have until 645 to do so. Um, and you can use the raise hand function now on Zoom. Uh, and our agenda tonight can be found at mcb4.nyc. So with that, I want to pass it over to the captain from the 10th for an update from them. Captain Galt. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, great to be on here with you. This is, I guess, my first uh, interaction with you as officially the uh, the chair. So congratulations on that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the last we met, I, I think I met you down in the uh, in the meatpacking district. So I hope everyone's been well and had a nice summer. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm actually I'm doing double duty tonight, too. So I'm, I'm actually at an abortion rally on the east side right now, but it's kind of wrapping up and I'm in a car. So I'll, I'll stay on with you all as long as uh, as long as I can. And as long as, the, you know, as long as I don't get pulled for something. But I just wanted to you know, start out by letting that be known that I'm uh, that I'm, I'm doing I'm doing a couple of things right now. Um, so. Um, so obviously a lot going on in the city. Uh, we're coming back from covid. Um, people are starting to, you know, everyone's back to work and, um, the city, the city is, is, is alive. And now we're coming into the fall and school is back in session. So there's a, there's a number of, number of issues and number of concerns, um, that are out there. So I, I don't know, um, particularly what you would like to discuss today. I'll just go over, I'll, I'll just start it out with a couple of, couple of statistics and, um, and then I'll open it and I'll defer to you, Jeffrey, if you would. That if sounds you, good. If you have some some questions or anything like that. Um, sure. So, so it's not comparatively speaking, the 10th precinct is, is one of one of the commands in all of Manhattan South that's doing a lot better comparatively uh, in terms of in, in terms of our crime conditions. Uh, but I don't have good news to report. So year to date, we're up 38 um, percent. In terms of in terms of our raw crime numbers, the index crimes that we track, those are like the FBI index crimes. So that's not a good number. But if you compare us to the rest of the rest of Manhattan South, um, we're doing better than a number of the commands because the borough as a whole is up forty six percent year to date. You forty six point three three. So we're we're at about thirty eight percent. A lot of these crimes are. are um, you know, are particularly alarming. There's, there's, we have increases in robberies. We have uh, we have increases. We have increases in felony assaults. So it's not just the property crimes. Uh, although the property crime increases uh, are particularly driving the overall increase, where uh, we're seeing burglaries up year to date forty three percent. What I will tell you is um, the police of the tenth precinct and really of the NYPD are working really hard, and we're you know. It's not just crime increase; it's arrest increase. We're we're up significantly for arrests, particularly our narcotics level arrests, because um, a lot of these crimes are, I believe, and I think I think the strong evidence that a lot of these crimes are being uh, driven by addiction and, and uh, mental health issues, and, and and obviously there's a number of homeless issues. So uh, a number of our arrests are, are uh, narcotics arrests. We're we're up 59 percent year to date. In our narcotics arrest, so tenth um, precinct narcotics arrest, 169. This is through this past Sunday, which will be the end of the Comstat reporting. But every day, you know, I could report to you today. I came in, uh, I came in. We had a couple more, a couple more arrests come through today, uh, um, and and particularly one of the areas of concern I know uh, is is up by the Hell's Kitchen area. So we we, we brought an individual in today uh, in possession. Uh, in possession of narcotics. Uh, this individual, what we're seeing a lot of the individuals that we're bringing in, um, they're already wanted. So th th this individual had a bench warrant already. So he's in custody. And um, 
So the Hell's Kitchen area is an area of concern, I know, for the community. And then the lower end, the 8th Avenue end, 21st and 8th, uh, we had another individual that we brought into custody today. This was just a, a basic engagement. This individual is out there, uh, I believe, with an open container. So people are out there doing, uh, my officer out there doing quality of life enforcement. They come upon an individual for what would be a, a summonsable offense. And again, this individual had a bench warrant, so he did not qualify for a summons. So we're taking him into custody. Um, so number of issues, I'll be happy to turn it back to you, Jeffrey, if, if you wanted to speak about anything anything uh, in particular. But uh, the main message that I have is crime is up, but arrests are up as well. And, and typically uh, in the past, what you would see when, when arrests are up, crime goes down. Uh, we're not seeing that, unfortunately, but we're going to continue to make these arrests and we're going we're gonna to do the best we can to, to try and stem, stem the, the crime that's occurring and, uh, and, and the, the quality of life deterioration. Well, I appreciate that very much. And of course, the acknowledgement of sort of what we would probably refer to as our hot spots based on your precinct, uh, that corridor along 8th Avenue in Chelsea, and then um, the northern part of the 10th, uh, sort of the middle of our district in Hell's Kitchen. So thank you for acknowledging that. Um, any questions from board members? Bernal and then Joe. Uh, thank you for presenting to us today. Um, looks like there was um, a lockdown in the Foundling School today. I know it's not part of the 10th district, um, but uh, you know the communication was pretty poor from the school to the parents, and also parents were concerned that you know the the, the, the overall security situation. Anybody can walk into the school. Is is that something that that's on your radar? Are you concerned about that? I always have concerns about anything that involves children. You know, that, that's an important mission for the police department. Uh, obviously, the schools are controlled by the principal and we have a school safety division, but we take an active role in terms of partnering with them. Uh, I can tell you yesterday, I actually had a, a, uh, a stakeholder meeting with the hierarchy of the school safety division. Uh, actually, the number two, the executive officer, Denise Marr was in my office yesterday. Uh, and we discussed a number of issues as they pertain to the 10th precinct, uh, and we need to be coordinated, um, and we need to we need to be mindful of any kind of emergencies or any kind of criminal activity that's occurring around those schools. Um, the 10th precinct is plugged into. I, I don't want to speak about someone else's command or what happened today, but uh, certainly, <clears throat> certainly anything involving children, anything involving emergencies is at the basically at the highest level of, of our priorities. Thanks, Captain. Um, just folks know, I'm, the Gwen will have the last question for the Captain, FYI. So um, Joe, you're up next. Yes. Hi, Captain Gold. Nice, nice to see you and happy that your officers are really out there trying to help us. Uh, we have two hotspots, as you know, of the, on 36th, at, just west of 10th Avenue, the canoe which is right. heavy duty narcotics dealing and narcotics use. Reported today from the uh, health kitchen, Hudson Yards Health Kitchen bid, they collected the largest number of syringes in a month, 500 syringes up from 200 last month in the pickups in the street, in the tree beds and then in the, in the canoe. So I want you to be aware of that, that it's really accelerated. And the other hot area is 40th Street, just west between uh, 9th and Dyer. Uh, heavy duty activity with the window washers who are involved in a lot of drug activity at the same time. I work on that corner. I see it all the time. And I know that we're doing a tour, I guess, in a week or so, but it's a really important corner because it's getting heavier and worse. So I wanted to bring it to your attention. Yeah. So what, I, what obviously we're very well aware of those, those particular areas. The individual that we brought into custody today uh, over at 21st and uh, 21st and 8th, no, actually, he, he was the one that we brought into custody up up at um, 30. We, we got him today at 39th and, and 9th. Um, he was brought in recently. Uh, he was brought in um, earlier in the 28 day period for narcotics possession as well. We brought him in from 40th and 9th. Today, we brought him in from 39th and 9th. Um, his, his arrest, I, I mean, I have breakdowns of all this. His arrest from 40th and 9th has already been already been dismissed and sealed. Um, so th th these, are, these are the issues that we're doing. So, you know, we're going out day after day and we're gonna continue to bring them in. 
Uh, the standard that my officers have is, is good faith arrest based on probable cause. And then what happens to these arrests after that is not really, really for us. I mean, obviously we, we want, we want a, a good out outcome and we want to, we want to correct these issues, but, but we are seeing a number of the same individuals and we're aware of those locations. Now, when you speak about the canoe area, 36, you know, and ninth over uh, dire within this 28 day period, there was a particularly high, high value. Well, when I say high value, a pr particularly problematic individual who was recently released on parole. So my officers were there, uh, obviously, uh, the, the good faith probable cause arrest based on criminal possession of controlled substance in the seventh degree. Uh, this individual was arrested for that. That arrest, unfortunately, is already sealed as well. So I can't speak as to any kind of the specifics on that. But we're aware of those locations. We're aware of the recidivism that's going on. Um, and we will continue to enforce. Thank you very much. Tina. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I, it, this is like maybe a very simple question. Um, if we're having such problems with narcotics, what's being done to stem the flow into our community? Can you give us some insight into that? I can't speak to the actual investigations that are ongoing because they're ongoing investigations. What I will say is from the 10th precinct patrol perspective, we don't, my officers don't do narcotics investigations. What we do is we gather intelligence and we pass it along to the narcotics division. Uh, what I will tell you is, though, I consult quite regularly with those investigators in in the narcotics division. I don't have access to their case files, and in terms of in terms of the outcomes, or I, I can get sometimes when when they do a a, a particular arrest, like I can follow in terms of seeing the outcome of that arrest. Um, but what I will tell you, without getting into any specifics, there are a number of narcotics investigations underway. Uh, I know 21st and 8th Avenue is one particular area of concern, uh, and there's a person of interest that's currently being investigated, and I can't really speak any much more about that. Uh, it's an investigation for, for the street-level sales over there. Right. But I'm talking a little more on a, 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 you know, a global basis, if you will, in terms of if it's happening in our community, I'm sure it's happening in other communities and there are individuals and individuals and individuals, right? Selling, where, where is, where's, where's it coming from and what, what narcotics are we really looking at? Is it a fentanyl, um, you, you know? Oh, I guess well, well, what, we're seeing, what we're seeing in terms of like what Joe Restuccia was talking about, yeah. this, is very, this is very low level kinds of narcotic sales. This right. is street level, you know, the, these are my observations in terms of those are the users are obviously the users and they're desperate and, and they need help. Uh, and the sellers are street level sellers. They're not, they're, it's not a very sophisticated enterprise. Uh, I, it's my belief that a number of the sellers are actually users as well. Uh, and, and I'm seeing the same thing down in the lower end in terms of uh, obviously there's a pro couple of problematic locations, uh, 24 hour uh locations that individuals are coming in and out of it kind of complicates the situation. Uh, but what we're seeing is it's not, it's not, it's not a very sophisticated kind of, um, you know, sale and use. It's, it's very, it's, it's, it's low level. I can't speak. I mean, obviously the NYPD has a very robust narcotic. We, we have a, we have a task force with the, with the uh, drug enforcement, with the federal task force, they get into the heavy duty investigations. And I'm not saying that there's not heavy duty, dealing going on. This is Manhattan. But what I'm seeing in day to day, what's affecting the quality of life of, of the residents of the neighborhood is, is kind of low level desperation and individuals that are, that are, they're making money. Certain, certainly people are profiting, but, but it's, I don't see it as being a highly sophisticated uh, net enterprise. I, I don't, that's not my area of expertise. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, pontificate too much on that, but, but that's what we're seeing. Right. Do you think they might be the, the you know, uh, narcotics yeah. division would be interesting? You know, this is going to this is going to be the last part of your follow up because okay. I want to keep it going. OK, yeah, it would be interested in <laughs> coming to the community board. I mean, I yeah, it, I think certainly we could we could probably uh, if, if um, I don't want to cut you off, Jeffrey. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say it sounds like there's very specific questions that have to do with the narcotics division. And so I wonder if it's worth outreach in terms of 
of, of that angle of NYPD if we should engage them, uh, because obviously the captain's scope only goes so far, yeah, so exactly. perhaps a different arm of the PD. We're on the same page, Jeffrey. Perfect, thanks, Tina. Um, David. Uh, thank you, Captain Galt. Um, I'm curious what you think is driving the increase in crime, uh, narcotics related and otherwise. Is this still social ills related to COVID? I think certainly COVID was a game changer. Um, I, I believe uh, I, be, I believe the city has not. I, I recall Manhattan being much different. I'm a Manhattan resident myself, um, so I, I certainly think um, that that COVID was a big game changer. And and obviously a, m a number of a number of things have occurred in Manhattan. Uh, a number of people have left Manhattan as well. A number of people have no longer come to work on a regular basis. Um, so I think there's a, a confluence of things. What, what I'm seeing, you know, in a number of the neighborhoods of concern to me is um, scaffolding issues. We, we're having this, this ongoing issue with scaffolding, um, areas that are not properly lit, areas that are not properly uh, exposed to uh, foot traffic and and these are these are these are kind of challenges that I've been working with with some of our elected officials to kind of uh, alleviate um, the bigger kind of policy issues. I'm not going to get into that into the policy uh, issues, but clearly uh, clearly we have a crisis, uh, a narcotics crisis. Uh, there there are a number of individuals that are in need of services or they're in, in need of some some type of intervention to get them out of the cycle of being arrested, released, and then back out there using drugs. So there has to be, there has to be some sort of uh, mechanism. Uh, I'm not a policy wonk, I'm law enforcement. Uh, our role in this is to you know, enforce laws. Uh, so I don't wanna get too much into, into some of the policy stuff, but clearly what I can tell you is my observation is that, that there, there is a problem out there uh, and I think, uh, I think it needs to be dealt with. Thank you. Thanks, Captain. Katie? Hi, Captain Galt. Thanks so much for being here with us this evening. And I really appreciate your comments uh, that you were just saying about, clearly there are lots of people who need services and who need treatment. And that's clearly something that needs to be addressed. I just wondered, um, I was having a hard time figuring out sort of percentages, like what the hard numbers are. So you mentioned that, um, that the arrests are up dramatically for narcotics. Can you just give us a sense of like, what that number translate to? Is that like 120 people? So we, we have 100? so 169 uh, narcotics level arrests year to date through last Sunday. Great, okay. And the, perfect, thank you. And then just my last one was, so I have the impression from what you were saying, but can you just tell me if I'm correct, that most of these arrests tie to users and not correct. dealers, is that right? Uh, well, I would say the overwhelming majority, but I, my officers are not, are not trained narcotics investigators. So we don't really, okay. we don't get involved in narcotics investigated inve mm -hmm. investigations. We get involved in street level mm -hmm. observations and, and, and encounters. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yes, you'd be correct that these, these are, these are drug users. Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Gwen, did you still have a question? Mm -hmm. One more shot, Gwen. There you well, go. I, I'm. I'm. Um, okay. Go. Yeah. Um, so my my question have pretty much been covered by Tina, um, and uh, it gets into the more the narcotic stuff. So I know that you're not an expert on that. So we'll wait on that. Great. Um, thanks, Gwen and Captain. Um, Thank you for being here this evening. Um, that's gonna wrap up our question portion uh, with you. Mike, I know you have your hand up, but I had said Gwen would get the last question. Four other folks had their hands up and, and put that down. So I wanna respect the captain's time. Appreciate him being uh, here tonight while he's on the ground over on the east side and the other other part of the district. Um, and well, you know, it's a good question. I have a good question. Mike, Jeff. Mike, I'm, Mike I'm really gonna ask that you respect the fact that four other people had their hand up. Um, and we called the queue at Gwen. So I want to respect the captain's time as well. 
uh, and really thank him for being here and to keep up uh, the continued diligence and good work uh, in the community. Thanks, Jeffrey. All the best. Hope to see you soon. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for those questions and for that conversation. I want to move now uh, to actually a part of the meeting that is not on the agenda. Usually, uh, I would call elected officials to the stage um, a bit later during that portion of the meeting. However, we are joined by our, by our state senator this evening, Brad Hoylman, because um, he's here to offer a special recognition to a member. And so I want to give him the floor for that honor this evening. Senator? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for indulging me uh, and the New York State Senate for this special honor. First, just let me say I appreciate uh, uh, the commanding officer's comments. Uh, he met with us uh, in a group that was organized by Councilmember Botcher the other day, and I walked by PS11 this morning, and he had his officers on foot patrol there. So I know uh, a lot of community board members have been asking for that, and a lot of parents. So I wanted to thank him for that. Uh, and secondly, uh, relevant is an effort that I, uh, Councilmember Botcher, Assemblymember Godfrey had have helped lead to try to get the state of New York to apply for a federal waiver under Section uh, 1115 of the Social Security Act uh, to get federal dollars for patients in residential psychiatric facilities here in the state. There's a lot of money that New York has left on the table because, because we in years past have not applied for this waiver. Uh, I asked the Medicaid director about it during budget hearings. I passed a bill in the Senate to facilitate the application uh, and a number of elected officials have been pressing the state. Uh, good news is yesterday they applied for the federal waiver. So that's gonna be more money for residential treatment and other services. So that's just a, a very positive development I think uh, that we can all share and making happen. But I'm here because every year the state Senate recognizes 63 women across the state of New York who are distinguished in their communities. Um, they uh, are women selected by senators who we think serve as role models for others to emulate and follow. Uh, we pass a resolution uh, every year to that effect uh, to ensure that the um, the honor is in our uh, records for forever. And, um, and we make it uh, usually uh, a virtual presentation uh, in these COVID times, but hopefully in person soon. But I'm very honored to present uh, for the 27th Senate District, the Woman of Distinction Award honoring women in New York in recognition of her noteworthy achievements to your colleague and mine, Christine Berté. I can hear the roar of applause. All right. And um, we all know how fabulous Christine is. I will just read you a few things. Uh, former chair of CB4, served as co-chair of its transportation committee, chair of the planning committee of the Hudson Yards Health Kitchen Alliance Business Improvement District. She founded CheckPeds uh, 15 years ago, which we all know about, uh, best in class advocacy organization uh, and very rare at its time to advocate on behalf of uh, pedestrians and for reducing traffic congestion. Uh, we know that CheckPeds has worked with DOT, the Port Authority, NYPD, elected officials to redesign traffic flows on the west side and obtain crucial safety improvements. We know that she's contributed to citywide efforts to improve transportation. In 2010, she gathered a coalition that produced a report on the intercity bus industry, the passage of an intercity bus state law, and creation of numerous parking spaces for this critical industry. And the new standalone bus terminal that we are building will have an intercity component, and that's largely due to Christine's efforts, along with colleagues here, many of whom I'm staring at right now uh, on Community Board 4. Yes, I'm talking about you, Joe Restitia. And Ms. Um, Berte, as it says here, campaigned for an idle-free New York to reduce idling and improve air quality. Remember, she passed out air testers uh, to elected officials and community board members, which was a really cool idea, which resulted in legislation limiting idling time around schools. She led teams of residents to measure air quality on the west side. She contributed to the 2019 New York City Master Plan legislation to dedicate more street space to pedestrians, cyclists, and bus riders. 
She is part of the Penn Station Complex Community Advisory Committee Working Group and the Port Authority Bus Terminal Replacement Working Group. Check Peds is currently a partner of the New York City Department of Sanitation to address the piles of garbage located on the sidewalk and moving to the curb. She lectures at the Earth Institute of Columbia University and trains community board members on transit planning as part of the Borough President's annual training, training program. She serves on the boards of Transportation Alternatives and Open Plans Streets blog. She was born in Algeria. She experienced civil war before immigrating to France as a refugee. Uh, nobody knew Christine was French, did they, right? That's a revelation. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, she, she's, the, I have to say, she's one of the most stylish uh, community board members. And I think that comes from her French origins. She started as a systems engineer at IBM after getting an MBA from HEC France and moved to New York City in 1980. She has held executive positions in technology and financial industries, running startups, and has worked with global companies. She works part-time at Sunnyside Records, her family-owned independent jazz label. Christine Berté was selected as a 2022 Women of Distinction honoree by me, State Senator Brad Hoylman. Christine, I will present these to you in person. I may come to your house and knock on your door and give them to you, but you are so deserving, and I know that your colleagues and mine agree it. We could not do our Thank work in the community without you, Christine. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Senator, this is so thoughtful. I mean, I'm, I'm blushing and deeply honored and moved by this award. This is very, very nice. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm only a little tugboat, which is forever pushing the enormous barge of our city governments <laughs> and trying to make changes. And it takes many hands to make it happen. So just not, not just me. And I want to share this award with all the amazing women who serve on the board. They are talented, they are thoughtful team players and let's make the city a better place together. Thank you so much. Well, now I feel like I'm blushing and I want to cry because that was such a nice acceptance speech in the moment. Uh, so, I mean, Senator, thank you for presenting this tonight. Um, Christine, well-deserved. Um, and of course, um, classy in your thanks and remarks of sharing thank it with you. the rest of the women on the board. So, um, bravo. Brad, thank you so much for being here thank and for that. Thank you very much. Um, All the best. Moving on uh, with the agenda. And I want a picture of you and Christine, you know, properly posed, holding that yeah. plaque, right? The way that we're supposed to do these things. We'll have to Absolutely. go to the park. We'll have to go to the park again. Exactly. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, All righty. Thank you uh, for that, Brad. Um, and I need to find my tabs now so we can continue on in the agenda. Um, next up is a public hearing uh, regarding... Uh, the statement of district needs uh, and our budget requests for the next fiscal year. Um, that would ordinarily be run by our second vice chair, uh, Leslie Murphy. She's chair of the budget task force. Um, but I don't think we had any signups. Jesse, did we get any new signups that I'm not no, aware, that not, we weren't aware of? Not for this hearing, um, but I think Leslie just wanted to give an introduction. As Ab I, that's, absolutely. Leslie, the floor is yours. I was wondering if there were any signups and I was gonna ask the same thing, Jeffrey, uh, but I guess we'll be formal, right? About the public hearing for our budget ask process. And just to give everyone uh, listening just some insight, every year we form and submit our, what's called our statement of district needs, which is as a community board, um, uh, a review of all our committees asked throughout the year. And each committee discusses and prioritize these asks of the city and city agencies. Our budget task force, which is comprised of community board members really across all the committees, we gather and discuss each of the committee's recommendations to form a priority of those asks. And I was gonna open it to the public to comment on this topic and process, but I guess there is no public to comment. Correct, Jesse, just to make sure. I mean, unless there's someone that wants to raise their hand right now, I don't believe Brian who is Sloan who has his hand up is, he's raised it for the public session that's coming up. So, um, but I, okay. I, is there someone else, but no. Okay. Well, I guess then I would like to close this public hearing, um, but not before I give a plug. So we have a district survey actually, which is out now, and we want to encourage people to take a look and participate, whatever is important to them. So then we can 
kind of um, take that in and um, incorporate it in our thinking and discussion. And that can be accessed on our website, right, Jesse? Yeah, the, it uh, will be, yes. Survey. It's gone out a number of times over our email, yep. but we will be putting it on our website shortly. And also all of our budget task force meetings are open to the public. Um, there's one on the 11th, there's one on the 25th. You can watch live if you'd like, or you can uh, go to our community board for YouTube channel and watch it. So thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks, Leslie. Um, and also folks should watch out because over the next month or two, um, each committee will be taking up their um, budget discussion points as well. So call out for committee members and also for the public to tune into those conversations to be a part of them as well. All righty, um, Leslie, it's gonna um, stay with you actually, because our first vice chair is not with us this evening, unfortunately. Um, dealing with the loss of her mother-in-law and her family just the other day. So she's not with us tonight, but we certainly extended our sympathies and thoughts to her and her family. So with that, I want to pass it back to Leslie to please run the public session. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. So this is the public session, um, and we want to welcome you to the public session. Uh, we continuously encourage residents, businesses, those passing through our district to share their comments here with us and for the record. So I do have the sign up sheet and I wanna thank those who have signed up. We will bring you over in the order of the sign up list that I have. Let me just pull that up and get my tabs, Jeffrey. Um, so I just wanna remind the speakers that each speaker will have two minutes to speak on whatever they would like. And I will go in order um, of this list. And the first one we have uh, the first three, actually, Molly Harris, Brian Sloan, and Allison Stone. Are they over, Jesse? Uh, yes, Molly and Brian are. I don't have Allison, but uh, the following person, Tom, mm. like, yeah, I do. So. Okay, great. Molly, are you with us? I'm here. You ready? Hi, Molly. You ready? I'll, I'll start in two minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Hi, my name is Molly Harris. I live at 217 West 22nd Street in Manhattan. I've been a resident of this block a little less than 15 years. And I'm speaking about the uh, proposed, well, the current situation with the closed open streets on West 22nd between 7th and 8th. And the proposal, I know there's a hearing or the public forum coming up on the 15th, but I do wanna share the, the full board a little bit of my thoughts. Um, I have been spent the last few weeks reaching out to my neighbors concerning the current status of the block's closure to all but local traffic 12 hours a day, seven days a week, as well as the proposed closing of the block except for emergency vehicles and garage parking and turning it into some sort of dog park and street and par park. And I gotta tell you, um, it's uh, most residents are very against it. Um, they feel frustrated by the increased traffic on the surrounding blocks, the lack of access to deliveries, cabs, Ubers, who don't feel like they have a right to be down there. The signage tells them don't come in. Um, there's a concern for seniors and disabled people who are unable to get around and delays due to accessoride vehicles. Safety concerns for pedestrians as cars must stop to move barriers and bikes are denied entrance to the street so end up on the sidewalks to get around, especially those um, pedal assist. Uh, additional safety just concerns as emergency fire and police response times will be increased. Um, having spoken to a firefighter specifically about that. Loss of business to both the parking garage and the um, dry cleaning service. Um, increased pollution due to the maze of other street closings that we know and you know are, are aware and restrictions on turning off of 23rd Street. I spent the last hour this afternoon visiting with my neighbors and the majority are very concerned and not supportive of this measure. I also encourage every one of you to get on the Nextdoor app if you are already on it and really read and see what's going on. I've been on there and I was quite actually surprised at how against the community is. I know that in the past you've seen surveys in which you've seen this that's huge amount of minutes, work. Molly. I'm sorry okay. to interrupt you. I'm sorry. That's All right. Minutes. So that's that's the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next on our list, we have Brian Sloan. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. My name is Brian. Um, I live in Chelsea for a long time. I'm a PS11 parent. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, the uh, Delhi bodega that exists at 215 8th Avenue. It's also called the West 21st Street Deli and Grocery. 
Uh, this, this bodega is uh, 300 feet from PS11, uh, the newly renamed uh, Sarah J. Garnett School. And in front of this bodega, you heard from Captain Galt about a half hour ago, significant narcotics, open container, and other activities in front of the deli. Um, I'll, I'll remind you of Captain Galt's quote, that someone was arrested for an open container uh, today in, in front of that bodega. Um, just based on parents' observations, significant amounts of beer and other types of alcohol are coming from this bodega at 215 8th Avenue. This uh, bodega's liquor license uh, to sell alcohol expires uh, at the end of December of this year. Um, I have two asks uh, for the community board. Number one, uh, do not approve the SLA beer renewal uh, for this deli. Again, it expires in just a couple of months on uh, December 31st. And my second ask, our second ask is, um, we'd like to remove the uh, Link NYC kiosks uh, that exist around this area. Uh, those, those, those big things with the screens, they're on, there are four of them on the west side of the block from 20th to 22nd Street. Um, we believe uh, that we need a mix of community board uh, involvement and the NYPD, uh, which we need for approval from the city to remove these. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, next I have on our list is Allison Stone. Uh, Jesse, you said she, you don't see her, is she? Or you do? No, I, I don't have Allison, so I think we should move on. If she comes in later, sure. we, can, we can add her up. The next three you can bring over then are Tom Lunky, Daryl yep. Hall, yep. and Joseph Newhouse. Uh, Tom, I see you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, Melanie Bryant is in Amsterdam right now getting inspiration. So on behalf of both of us, I just want to thank all of our neighborhood sponsors, including Council Member Eric Botcher, Community Board 4, Check Peds, special shout out to Christine uh, for her award, um, Chelsea West 200 Block Association, and numerous local businesses, and give a friendly reminder of our upcoming West 22nd Open Street Community Visioning Workshop. It's a little over a week away on Saturday, October 15th from 12 noon to 2 p.m. at St. Paul's German Evangelical Lutheran Church, 315 West 22nd Street between sub, uh, 8th and 9th Avenues. We are gathering together to share empathy, respect, and thoughtful ideas for making West 22nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenues a more pleasant, community-friendly garden street while maintaining vehicular access for sanitation and emergency vehicles, existing residents, businesses, and garages on this block. Please drop by and spend a couple of hours with friends, neighbors, and colleagues. For more information, please see the September resources and upcoming events email from Manhattan Community Board 4. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next, we have Daryl Hall. <laughs> Daryl, are you with us? Daryl, you need to unmute yourself. I see him here. I just yeah, he's Darryl, here. Can, yeah, he's, he's muted. Why don't we keep on going and then we can follow yeah. back Darryl if he can if he figures understand un, okay. to, to unmute himself. Yeah, absolutely. I do see Joseph though. Joseph, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. My name is Joe Newhouse. I live on West 22nd Street between 8th and 9th and I've lived here with my wife and sons for 25 years. I saw that Community Board 4 is sponsoring an open meeting to discuss the future of the closing of West 22nd Street between 7th and 8th uh, that Molly and, uh, and uh, Mr. Lunke have talked about. I was concerned that the starting point appeared to be the current closing in daytime hours and then that the effort is to look for ways to expand that. And I wanted to speak just briefly because I don't want the board to think that the community is happy with what has happened here. The closure was an experiment put in place during COVID, but I don't think it has been successful. And I hope the board and others will keep an open mind to all alternatives and that one of the alternatives is to undo what has been done and to return the street to its prior state or at least to one without traffic barriers. 
Um, and I look forward to the meeting on the 15th to discuss this further with everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Joseph. Next, uh, the next three, we have um, Bobby Vangelo, Vangelitos, Karen Ehrenberg, and, and Lisa Wager. <laughs> if you, you can, um, if they're over, Jesse. They're all over. Oh, great. Bobby, can you hear me? It was over. Hold on. Okay. Something. Oh, there he is. Okay. Sorry, I'm bringing him over now. You may want to move to the next person. And yeah, no, him. no worries. Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Oh, great. I'm Hi, Karen. Go ahead. Hey, everybody. Hey, I'm I'm Karen Ehrenberg. Um, I am a neighbor who lives on 22nd Street between 8th and 9th. I forgot to set my timer. Oh well. Um, and I have been here with my family, our two sons, for about 16, 17 years, and my husband. Um, also, I, I've been involved slightly in this community board, but I'm very active on community board too because I've run, helped run Greenwich Little, Little Village Little League for the last uh, 15, uh, 10 to 12 years. Um, I'm still on the executive board there, very involved in the community in lots of ways. And I believe in outdoor space and parks. I've been at many community board meetings to protect parks for our children um, and our adults and for free time and bike riding at Hudson River Park and so forth. However, I am a believer that streets have a reason and they're for cars to drive through. I'm all for making sidewalks more amenable or big, but I do think that it's a real safety issue. It's a, a pollution. I, I drive through that street all the time, um, whether or had with Ubers and so forth. And now I also park in that garage. And I, I also resent the fact that if you own a car in New York, you're called a wealthy car owner. I raised two kids here and had to bring them all over the place. And we use public transportation, but we also used our car and eventually decided it was too much to move it. So we used the garage, which is a community business that is now at risk. Um, I'm very worried about the movement, not only to close it partially open only in the evenings, which often I still have to get out late at night to move it because no one moves it, but also to put a park or a dog park on a street as a dog owner for many years. I love a good dog park, but I think those also belong in parks and not streets. I think our city grid was built for a reason. And I hope that our, that because we did something during COVID, which made a lot of sense when less people were here, we all needed to get outside. I don't see why we're undoing the wisdom kind of randomly because a couple of neighbors that lived on that street pick that street without a lot more study. I, I, I strongly oppose it and agree with Molly and Joe on this issue. Thank you. Karen, you hit the two minute mark exactly. Good for me, thanks. Thank you. Um, do we, is Bobby over uh, now, Jesse? We can Bobby's go back to him. Now. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, hi, Bobby, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Bobby Vangelatos. I'm the new center manager at the Chelsea Recreation Center. I wanted to take this opportunity tonight to talk a little bit about our fall programming session, uh, which actually started this past Monday and also highlight a few programs. Uh, first off, this Saturday from nine to 12, we're gonna be hosting our Breast Cancer Awareness Fitness Festival at the center. It's free for any, everyone, anyone can come and show up. Um, we're going to have three different classes, two body toning classes, one from 9 to 9.45, followed by a Zumba class from 10 to 10.45, and then another body toning class from 11 to 11.45. And we're also going to have some nice giveaways for participants. Um, we also have programming for all ages at the Recreation Center, ranging from fitness to painting, to art classes for adults and children, a drop-in program for school-aged children during after-school hours, a variety of sports clinics, chess classes, dodgeball, zumbini, which is for toddlers, and a lot more. For more information, you can always go on our center website at the New York City Parks website, or you can give us a call at 212-255-3705. Um, that's all I have for tonight, and I look forward to seeing everyone. Thank you, Bobby. Um, Lisa Wager, I don't know who she is, but let's bring her over. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. 
Go ahead. Hi. Well, by way of introduction, my name is Lisa Wager. I'm the Director of Government Community Relations at the Fashion Institute of Technology, the main campus of which is in CB5, but our thousand person res hall is on 31st between 8th and 9th and CB4. I've got two items to report and they illustrate the breadth and depth of what happens at FIT. We've got a new show, Resurgence, opening on Monday in the Art and Design Gallery. That's the glass cube at the corner of 27th and 7th. And the show showcases a diversity of artisan work and handcrafted objects from around the globe, including textiles, jewelry, and decorative accessories, and displays the ways that artists master technique, material, and design. It's pretty beautiful. I walked through it today on my way out. Contributors to this show include FIT alumni, faculty and students, as well as finalists from the 2022 Global Eco Artisan Awards. Many of the Global Eco Artisan finalists are informally trained artisans who learn their expertise through generations of family or regional craft practices. And the contributors from the FIT community are drawn from the footwear and accessories design, jewelry design, and textile surface design departments. Their unique pieces highlight FIT's hands-on curriculum and represent how mastering artisanship can lead to successful entrepreneurship. I'm also happy to report that FIT faculty and student research activity has never been more robust. Case in point, the National Science Foundation has approved four active grants for FIT faculty, the most in the college's history. The grants funded research for studying nutrition through gaming, a chemical recycling process for cotton fabric, advancing wearable technology manufacturing, and for a nearly $200,000 electron microscope, a machine which magnifies an object thousands of times, allowing researchers across FIT to characterize fibers, coatings, and other materials. And that came through the extremely competitive NSF major research instrumentation program, where only 20% of the requests get funded. Oops, I'm out of time. Thank okay, you, Jesse, I sent you a link to the article where there's like lots of fun stuff about those, uh, those, pro those uh, research projects. If you want to put it in, it's much juicier than what I had a chance to say. They're pretty cool. Thank you. I'll, I'll send it around, Lisa, for sure. Thank you. Maybe in the chat, maybe, since I can't touch no, that. No, we don't do the chat. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Brian Sloan. I haven't seen you in years. Bye. Um, Jesse, do we have Andrea Ackerman? She's the last on my list. I don't know if you have any additionals. Uh, no, that's that's all we have um, signed okay. signed up. So that's the last one. I I'll, I can give a I would like to give a brief report on a couple of things that were brought up during the public session. And wait, and hold I, on. I'm sorry. Is Jesse, Andrea's Andrea is not here. You're saying? Yes, I am yeah. here. Yes, yeah, she's yeah, here. Exactly. Yes. So can I talk? Yeah. Of course, okay. yeah, Andrea, you're um, the last one on our list. Let me let me give you your two okay. minutes. Go ahead. Okay, well, I guess I'm the lone person who uh, is talking to, uh, uh, I live at uh, 109 West 20, what? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I live at 109 West 26th Street, which is across from the Ainsworth, and I'm here to express my support for the draft letter, uh, from the quality of life um, licensing committee to uh, recommend that the liquor license be denied, both the permanent and the daily liquor license be denied for the Ainsworth. Um, I've lived here since 1998 and also since the Ainsworth came around since 2009. And I'd say um, the most important thing is that uh, all the stipulations that were asked of the Ainsworth to uh, correct or um, their behavior uh, for 13 years, they have done nothing. And so there's no hope that any, any kinds of stipulations will help them, you know, help the situation. I mean, it's time to give up on them. So um, uh, I, I hope that uh, the full board will um, support that. That's all. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, so Jesse, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. We had one more speaker I wanted to get in. No, no, I apologize, I was confusing. I was saying she's here and then I was speaking. So completely understand. Um, I, I, I think that ends our public session. Do you want, you had something to follow up on? That ends our public session. That ends our public session, thank you. <laughs>
Um, I just wanted to, two things just for the board's ed edification. Uh, the general, one of the gentlemen that was speaking about the uh, requesting us to deny a uh, liquor license for a bodega, uh, we the board do not receive those licenses. The the BLK BLP committee does not review those types of licenses. We don't get them sent to us. It's not a requirement for a bodega or a um, uh, a convenience store or grocery store to review have a community board review process. So. Uh, we don't we can particularly um, deny it, uh, but we will work obviously on making sure that the SLA is in, in complete knowledge of uh, any reports and anything that's going on there uh, illegally uh, or improperly. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to uh, flag was the person that uh, signed up who wasn't able to speak uh, was, I believe, Daryl Hall. He uh, works for Village Care, which is on West 46th Street. And I did a site visit with him actually uh, last week. I believe it was last week. Their situation, and uh, Council Member Botcher's office knows about it well, is uh, that their uh, rear, they have a second floor open space that has completely been required to be vacated by the Department of Buildings because of a neighboring building's uh, very dangerous wall. And so uh, their entirely new beautiful space for their, I think 80 something seniors that live there, no one can use it. Uh, it's a beautiful space. It's a beautiful building um, uh, facility, uh, but it's a beautiful space that's just sitting there, you know, empty because of this, this landlord who just is basically uh, neglecting to do what he's supposed to do. So uh, we are working. I did a site visit last week, and I um, and I am working with the council member's office to sort of expedite the, the the pressure that DOB can put on this owner, as well as trying to reach out to the owner to see get them on the get them to start working on the the building. So that's it. Jesse, um, actually, Daryl's here and he just raised his hand. So I don't know if you want to entertain that or, or Jeff, Jeffrey, I should ask. Well, I, I, no, I mean, I just want to okay. explain to the board and I'm happy to follow up with Daryl directly after this. Um, we, we have been in correspondence already, but, um, you know, and I'm happy to loop in, uh, you know, any member of the BLP committee that, you know, wants to on it. But uh, just giving the board explanation as to it's not enough. It's just certainly it's just not a license that we need have any real oversight over at this point. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, and thank you everybody for participating in the public session and Leslie uh, for stepping up on double hearing duty this evening. Thank you for that. Uh, continuing on our agenda, um, reports from elected officials. Uh, Manhattan Borough President uh, Mark Levine, I don't believe he's with us tonight, but um, his liaison Yi is with us tonight. Could we bring her over, Jesse? Yeah, yes, we can. Um, uh, I believe, though, is Mark joining us? I think Mark will be joining us. He's just oh, late. That's I want to perfectly fine. Then let's go to um, Matt Ty from Assemblymember Gottfried's office. He's coming over now. Perfect. And bring Jordan over as well. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Tai from Assemblymember Dick Godfrey's office. Um, first, this one offer congratulations to Christine on tonight's honor. Um, I know I could speak for all of my fellow staffers that um, she's taught us tons about keeping our streets safe to the point where I know for me, it's now hard to see a truck blocking a crosswalk without thinking of Christine, giving the driver a piece of her mind. So congratulations on that. <laughs> um, the first topic I wanna to talk about tonight is casinos. Um, by seeing the news that um, proposals for casinos are starting to come out. So I just want to talk about some of the background of that process. So under state legislation that was passed this spring, three additional casino sites may be licensed around the site, around the state. There's talk of at least two possible sites in Manhattan where applicants will likely submit proposals. It's Times Square on Hudson Yards. The other sites could certainly still emerge. So advance to this process beginning, I want to explain how the site and process is going to work and what the role the local community is going to have. So for a site in New York City, any proposal must comply with local zoning and ULARP and must first be approved by a two thirds vote of a six member community advisory committee that will be convened for each specific proposed site. That committee is going to consist of one member each appointed by the governor, the mayor and the borough president and the other three will be the state senator, assembly member, and city council member for the district where the site is located. 
Um, the state commission will designate and pay for a community consultant that will work with the local communities. And the law specifies that the local committee's proceedings will be subject to the state open meetings law. So this should be a very open and transparent process where all your local representatives are going to have a say. Um, so any site where all the local representatives are against it, that will kill the proposal right there. Following any proposal from that community, the proposal would then go to the State Gaming Facility Location Board, which will operate under the State Gaming Commission. The board will determine the final three sites to be awarded a casino license. So that's the process that's going to start unfolding in the coming months as we learn um, where folks want to propose these new casinos. Um, next, a bit about redistricting. So I know right now in the news a lot, there's a plenty about the city council redistricting maps and everything going on with that. But next year we get to have fun on the state level again, because we're going back to redo the state assembly maps. Last week, a state Supreme Court judge ruled that the independent redistricting commission must submit new lines by April, 2023, that would then be used for the 2024 elections. The IRC would have two opportunities to submit new maps to the legislature, and if they are both not accepted, then the legislature would draw its own maps. We kind of went through this process um, at the start of this year when we're going looking at the maps this year, but the court ruled that since the second maps of the IRC was never fully considered by the legislature, that the process did not follow the law, and that's why essentially the same process we went through must be convened again, and hopefully we'll go a lot smoother this time and a set of maps can be agreed upon. Um, there would be opportunities for local committees, local communities to submit opinions on the new maps. So certainly something to keep in mind on what you would like to see the new assembly district lines look like. Um, but it's still important to remember that while the court did just make this decision, appeals are still possible in this case and the process may certainly change again. Um, finally, just a quick note over the next couple of months, um, our office is focusing on a smooth transition to um, Dick's successor in the assembly. As you all know, he'll be retiring at the end of this year. Um, his last day in office is December 31st, so our staff are still available for constituent services and any issues that come up between now and then. And then the new member will take office on January 1st. And that is all I have for tonight. We'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that update, including the um, specific process on how can you, casino uh, licensing will happen um, downstate. Really appreciate that. Um, Jesse, did we bring Jordan over? We did. Hey, everyone. Mr. How are you? Hey there. Yes. Hello. I apologize for my background. I am currently um, driving, uh, not currently, um, but I'm going upstate this weekend for a friend's birthday, but I would not um hesitate to spend an evening with you all so thank you for having me um i have a handful of updates about what we've been up to um this past month um uh first of all uh participatory budgeting is back we had our pb kickoff uh on the high lines 14th street passage the very same place that you all had your lovely full board a couple months ago um the idea generation uh link is also online and we're also going to be doing neighborhood assemblies um, in Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, and the West Village, although that's CB2, and, you know, we don't talk about CB2. Um, uh, we're going to be doing those next week uh, to gather more ideas for this cycle. We're hoping for a really wonderful cycle, um, and the kickoff was fantastic. Um, we also did two street co-namings um, in CB4 um, with um, CB4 Transportation. One down in Chelsea for um, Robert Trent Lyon, who I know many people on this board um, knew personally, um, and then one up on West 42nd and Dyer for Jim Houghton Way. Um, we are also going to be hosting a homelessness and NYC virtual panel on Monday, October 17th at 6.30. Uh, that'll be featuring the council member, uh, Shane Cox, the assistant commissioner for the Department of Homeless Services, Jacqueline Simone. Policy Director for Coalition of the Homeless, Christine Quinn, President and CEO of Wynn, and Douglas James, COO of CUCS. Um, we sent out an email with the registration link on that. It'll be Monday, October 17th at 7.30. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. We think it's going to be a great discussion. Um, in that same vein, we also hosted a walkthrough of Hell's Kitchen 
with homeless outreach teams responsible for canvassing the neighborhood. Uh, that's breaking ground in CUCS as well. Um, we did that back on the 26th of September. Um, and as a result of that, we sort of saw the work that they do. Um, we brought a member of this board, Dolores Rubin, in her role as Midtown North Community Council president to that as well. Um, thank you, Dolores, very much for joining us. Um, and, you know, we're going to be fighting uh, to expand the array of services that these uh, homeless outreach teams can offer um, because we really want to, you know, they can go up to people, engage with them, and the people can say no. But if we really enhance the services that they can offer, um, you know, it's, it's just a lot better for everyone involved, certainly. Uh, we also um, have legislation with WIN uh, calling for mental health professionals on site in all family homeless shelters across the city. Um, we're really proud of that legislation. We're super excited about that. Um, uh, and then similarly, we also did a surprise visit to the skyline with two members of this board uh, to see the Mike families there and how they are um, being treated. Uh, thank you very much to Maria Ortiz and Jessica Chait. Um, and, you know, we were very pleased with uh, what we saw there, but we're still definitely working to ensure that, you know, these migrant families are taken care of and, you know, we can do what we can to help them. Certainly, we had a donation drive for them earlier as well. Um, and uh, lastly, I'll drop down a little south to Chelsea. We had the Chelsea Cleanup Corps uh, go around the neighborhood um, for a week in September, uh, cleaning up graffiti and, you know, cleaning up larger areas. Sanitation is definitely a, a big key thing for the council member, as definitely uh, many of you know. And we were very happy to have them in the area um, doing a lot of graffiti removal, other cleanups. And uh, we're fighting to have them come to Hell's Kitchen as well so we can do a holistic approach to Community Board 4 with this. Um, thank you all very much. Um, very much congratulations to Christine Berté. Very, very well-deserved. And also to Jesse Vodin for his award that he got at the uh, HYHK board meeting this morning. I don't know if the board knew about that, but definitely want to shout out Jesse as well for all of his hard work. Um, happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you, Jordan. Um, don't get lost upstate and please make your way there and back safely. I'll do my um, best, thank you. Of course. Uh, next up, we have the representative from Controller Brad Lander's office, Evelyn Collado with us this evening. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, apologies for not being on camera. Um, uh, tonight. Uh, first, uh, my name is Evelyn Collado. I'm the uh, Manhattan Borough Director for New York City Comptroller Brad Lander. Um, my congratulations to Christine. I first uh, came to hear of her through uh, my work with uh, former council member and current DOT Commissioner Idanis Rodriguez. Uh, congratulations again and well deserved. Um, tonight, I have a few updates. Uh, we have been busy over the summer and, you know, beginning of the fall. Uh, many things happening, but I'd like to bring attention to uh, some of the things that we have been doing uh, through climate action uh, and how they also um, sort of uh, inner uh, face with uh, some of the other um, uh, priorities of the office. So in alignment with our fiduciary responsibility to identify and confront risk, uh, risks to the financial well-being of uh, New York City government and residents, our office is committed to advance uh, a just transition toward a more equitable, uh, low carbon and resilient city through climate action. Uh, for that end, we have undertaken a series of actions, including creating the NYC Climate Dashboard that you can find uh, in our website, uh, comptroller.nyc.gov, that tracks our city's progress in meeting our climate goals uh, by assessing how effectively the city is reducing our ca carbon emissions and how prepared our neighborhoods are for the impacts of climate change. Uh, in line with uh, that commitment, we have also added our voice to that of 13 state secretaries in opposition to recent legislation uh, in different states aiming to curb consideration of environmental, social, and governance factors in investing. We uh, issue a letter to BlackRock Inc., which is uh, the largest uh, asset manager in the world, and also uh, the company um, uh, managing appro approximately $43 billion of uh, city investments in the pension system. 
Uh, we wrote to their chief executive officer uh, to express our growing concern over their um, you know, investment actions not aligning with uh, its climate commitments and to request that they immediately take action to address these contradictions as they have been backtracking on uh, climate commitments um, due to um, uh, political pressure from uh, the Republican Party. Also as well, we have in conjunction with uh, Mayor Adams um, issued uh, over $1.3 billion in general obligation bonds, including $400 million uh, of taxable uh, social bonds uh, for the month of October. These bonds will go to uh, support projects with positive social and environment, environmental outcomes, uh, $400 million of those, and they will support more than 3,000 units of affordable housing in New York City. Uh, we have uh, also conducted um, a series of uh, surveys this, uh, this summer, this past summer, uh, of NYCHA uh, developments uh, as we prepare to audit the agency. And some of those findings uh, will go to um, inform the work and the recommendations at the end. Uh, part of those findings, uh, uh, the fact that uh, nearly 60% of all residential building entrance doors are uh, currently open or have broken locks. And we are looking into ways to address this issue is dramatically up from uh, tw over 23%. Uh, from a similar review that we conducted, the office conducted in 2018. So uh, we are also doing, uh, you know, we have updates on the uh, prevailing wages worker rights front. Uh, today, the controller in conjunction with the office of the attorney general, uh, Tish James, uh, announced the recovery of $3 million from uh, a real, star, uh, real estate developer who was underpaying workers um, at a luxury residen residential property uh, and denying them uh, the, the, the prevailing wages and benefits. So um, we also um, have announced uh, a couple of weeks ago that more than 1,300 workers are entitled to payments totally, uh, totally nearly $3 million for prevailing wage settlements with several other companies. Uh, the work for uh, city funded projects. So those are some of the things that we have been doing over the last few months. And for those annou announcements and, uh, and more, please visit our website and uh, or feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you. Evelyn, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, okay. Uh, we will await the borough president's arrival and, and pause once, once he gets here. So Continuing on in our agenda, I'm going to pass it over to our esteemed district manager, uh, who did indeed receive uh, an award of recognition today from our friends at the Hudson Yards Hell's Kitchen uh, Bid and Alliance. So, Jesse, pass it over to you for your report. Well deserved. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'm actually, um, we're going to, if you don't mind, Jeffrey, we're going to let Sabrina go first. for. Oh, her sure. I thought that was next, but absolutely. Nominating committee report, if that's all right. Sure, so um, earlier this, as, as you'll recall, um, at the last meeting, we constituted the nominating committee to the season. Um, Sabrina is chair of that. They convened earlier uh, this month, and so we wanna pass it over to her for um, updates. Sabrina? Yep, good evening. Um, we met on Monday. Um, it was um, Christine, Dolores, Paul, Alice, and myself. Um, we interview the candidates for um, Jeffrey, for um, chair. First by chair, first chair uh, Jessica, and second um, vice chair Leslie, and then we also had um, um, Katie as, as well for secretary, co-secretary, and Roberta for um, co-secretary for the first time. Uh, we recommend um, everybody um, to um, to I guess to um, hold these elections or hold this candidacy. And um, we have, we will hold elections on, um, everybody will vote, I guess, on uh, December. Thank you. Thanks, Sabrina. Lowell? Yeah, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to bring this up, Jeffrey, but we go through this exercise every year. 
And I think it's time to look at the bylaws and just make the executive offices a two-year term so we don't have to go through this every year. I don't know if this is the appropriate time to bring that up. But it's fair. It's it's one of the things that I actually talked about in my interview, frankly. Um, but I I would um we have a couple of working groups going on right now. Obviously, we'd have to constitute a bylaws working group, but it it really may be worth it to to have that discussion because it did it was a topic of discussion. So um why don't we um put this on the agenda for the next exec committee? Uh does that sound okay with you from a, a pro, like a just sure. initial discussion standpoint? Sure. Yeah, no, it's it just, I mean, I, I, I think we should all be very proud that we have a very orderly, you know, transition from uh, of executive teams over the years. And, you know, we see where things are going. And, you know, part of what I know Jesse wants, having been through this before, is to make sure that there is, you know, a, a line of succession in place that because we have that it makes this nominating committee stuff almost superfluous i understand we have to do it but i see no reason why we have to do it every year and i'd love to take it up at exec thank you sure thanks for raising that uh so sabrina anything else to add there i think so what we'll have we we have our elections in december right and next month um will be any other updates from that and we go forward from there yeah, my understanding is next month, anybody who wants to consider, they can actually run and uh, will be um, on the ballot on, on, on December. Sure, folks can be nominated from the floor at the November meeting. Sure. Got it, okay. Uh, thank you for that uh, and for your work for this. Um, I'm gonna pass it back over to Jesse for his report. Hi, everybody. I I. I... I wholeheartedly agree that the executive committee should take a look at the bylaws and see where they think uh, would be uh, revisements should be done. I will just say I did get the chance to review the nominating committee's uh, meeting uh, um, uh, today on YouTube, and I got to say it was actually a really great set of conversations that everybody had and some really good questions and the the committee definitely took their time to really come up with a strategy and think about what they're asking of these members and so i do recommend taking a look at it um uh, if for anybody that's interested um anyway <laughs> i will go into my normal report uh, so very quickly, in-person meetings. So uh, we're meeting, obviously we're meeting virtually here, but just to confirm for everybody here, as well as from the, on the public, that uh, currently the city's EO for COVID-19 remains in effect. And the executive committee at its most recent meeting had determined to, to remain fully remote uh, at least until the end of October. Um, uh, what else? Um, CB4 will be drafting in their statement. As Leslie mentioned, they will be drafting their statement of district needs and budget requests for fiscal year 24. So each committee will have this on their agenda. Then this year, this month, they will need to, to vote on a set of priority budget priorities. Uh, for folks who are interested in participating in this, as Leslie mentioned, there is the online survey, which has gone out multiple times. We have already to already uh, over 250 people responded to that, so that's wonderful. Uh, but we will putting that on our website and sending that out again. Every committee, like I said, will be having this on their agenda. So if there's a, there's a particular topic that uh, you think that should be advocated for, this is the time to do so. Um, and then like it, uh, Leslie said, the budget task force will be meeting twice in the month of October on, on October 11th and 25th. So please look at the uh, calendar if you're interested in this process. Um, I did send out an email earlier about October's committee schedules just because it is very uh, jam packed and because of a number of different reasons, uh, some meeting, some new, uh, committees are meeting in different different times. So I'm just going to highlight the ones that are meeting at different times so everybody is on the same page. So Tuesday, uh, October 11th at 5 p.m. the budget task force is meeting. It'll be meeting before uh, the BLP committee. Uh, and ending before and ending before the BLP committee. Monday, October twenty fourth, is uh, the arts education, arts culture education street life committee. Uh, Tuesday, October twenty fifth, at six p.m. will be the budget task force, the second meeting of the budget task force. Thursday, October twenty seventh, at six thirty, will be the executive committee. I'm going to say that again. Thursday, October twenty seventh, at six thirty, will be the executive committee. 
I'm sorry, Jesse. Did you say that it was going to be on a Thursday? Executive I'm, committee on a Thursday. That's what, I, that's what I'm communicating to everybody on on on, on, on this meeting. Um, uh, and then all other committees are meeting at their regular scheduled time. We go back to a very normal schedule in November with very few changes. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and I think that's about it, unless there's someone that has questions for me. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, note the committee, do check the calendar. The calendar on the website properly reflects the committee schedule. Um, jumping in uh, forward to the chair's report, a couple of updates on small meetings and upcoming events. Um, the Chelsea Land Use Committee met with City Hall regarding the relocation of the EMS station. Um, seven site, uh, an ongoing topic of discussion for us, that's an ongoing ULERP process. Um, the Clinton Health Kitchen Land Use Committee provided testimony to, well, members of it did to the City Council regarding the DEP site for affordable housing project on 10th Avenue. And I also want to note that the borough president, in his response um, to city planning on that ULERP, uh, supported and backed up specifically our recommendations as well. So it was great to see that. Um, Chelsea Land Use also provided testimony at an LPC hearing uh, regarding 353 West 20th Street. And then Clinton Hell's Kitchen Land Use uh, continues its work with the Historic District Council regarding the Hell's Kitchen Historic District. Um, I wanted to see, Maria, I texted you about this, but if we can pause for a moment, there is a, a letter we're taking up <laughs> with so item 20 this evening. Hi. Okay, good. Regarding um, the asylum seeker and migrant crisis unfolding um, in our city and right in our backyard. Uh, and Maria, I wondered if you could take a moment to update the board on the drive that you are organizing. Yeah, um, thank you, Jeffrey. I was wondering about that, then I saw your text. <laughs> I was like, wait, I need to speak. Um, so uh, myself and some other members on the on CB4 are organizing a coat and diaper drive this coming uh, for November. Um, the drop-off for new and gently used coats and obviously new diapers, okay, <laughs> are gonna be, um, that, wait, what day? Is, that's Saturday the 19th. <laughs> Jeffrey, I see you. Um, excellent, excellent timing, Maria, on that joke. Oh, excuse me for the snorting. Um, the the drop-offs will be Saturday the 19th, and it's going to be at Metro Baptist Church. Um, I don't recall the time right now, Jesse, you might, but there'll be flyers going out soon about that. And Families are going to come on Sunday, the 20th and pick up, which is similar to what we did two years ago. Um, is that is there anything else I need to add right now, Jesse? No. Um, the, yeah. The general timing for the drop off is in the afternoon. My me memory serves uh, starting around after 12, but we will have a flyer. It'll be distributed widely. Please send it out to your list. Ser serve however you like to do it. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll we'll get that out very shortly. Thanks, Maria. Uh, stay tuned for more details on that, everybody. Yes. Um, sure. Just on working groups and ongoing meetings, um, Port Authority Bus Terminal Replacement Working Group. Um, there's now a formal schedule that's taking place, a, a series of conversations taking place to schedule um, a new consistent time as we re-engage uh, with the port in our continued discussions around the replacement and redevelopment of the terminal and their property. Um, on the Penn Station um, working group and that plan uh, for redevelopment, um, a part of our win on that was a public realm task force. And uh, we are a part of that task force and that meeting, the meetings of that working group kick off next week, uh, which is um, a good thing. Stay tuned for more updates on that. Um, you'll recall we convened a cannabis uh, working group, um, and they are continuing to figure out sort of how best to actually be effective. The state is not necessarily making that simple, but they are working towards meeting with the New York State Office of Cannabis Management uh, to understand all that's going on there and how we can best provide guidance um, on how to make things work within the community. And then finally, uh, my update for you this evening is a bit of uh, new news and some good news. Some of you may be familiar with a program called the NYU capstone program. Um, basically, it is a graduate program whereby a, a group of graduate students take on um, various proposals uh, to, to do specific um, 
projects for them. So we were encouraged to apply for a capstone um, by the leader of the lead of the program, who also happens to be a former CB5 member. Um, I put in a pitch in the um, heydays and high days of August, um, and I had a discussion. and And the good news was we were selected um, by Capstone to um, work with them. Thank you, Dale, for the claps there. Uh, basically, Board Four will be the client of these five graduate students at NYU. And the scope of the project, we will continue to uh, really refine. But the broad pitch was, and I talked about this at Exec uh, last month, we've seen tremendous changes um, along the western edge of our district, really the 11th Avenue and 9A corridors from Hell's Kitchen and down through Chelsea, um, and how all of that change is not necessarily connected uh, with what is largely our backyard and Hudson River Park and all the opportunities that Hudson River Park affords our community, but how tricky it is to get there, how many things we've long advocated for from land use changes to transportation improvements, to better connectivity for all of those in our community um, to our green spaces. So that was the broad pitch, they liked it. Um, and at my discussion with exec, um, the, the plan is to constitute a working group of which Jessica Chait, our first vice chair, uh, who also happens to be a capstone graduate student herself, uh, will chair that working group. And it will be made up of two members, um, no more than two members, each of the following committees. Waterfront Parks and Environment, Transportation, Clinton Hell's Kitchen Land Use, and Chelsea Land Use. And so uh, the co-chairs uh, will be continuing to meet over the next two weeks. We're kicking off the work with the capstone team. Um, and as the committees make that determination, they'll let me know. Um, that work will convene, and this is an eight to nine month engagement. So stay tuned for items to potentially come up on, on your agendas, um, or for this just to provide for me to be providing updates to you all on this. But this is a really exciting opportunity. Some of you may be familiar with uh, what's called a 197A plan. Um, back in the mid 2000s, Community Board 4 did a 197A plan for, for West Chelsea. Um, while we are not gonna get a 197A plan out of this, it was sort of framed as 197A light um, and sort of plus minus other things that we are looking for. So um, stay tuned for that and progress as we kick off with the NYU Capstone program there. Um, that concludes uh, my report. So now I would like to, I realized that I did something that, that I, I missed here. We didn't adopt the agenda. Uh, and so um, item 19 has been tabled, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, yes, it'll, it'll be on the November meeting. Yep. Thank you, Joe. So item 19 tabled. Um, if there's no other amendments to the agenda, could I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? Motion to adopt. Thank you, second. is there a second? Thank you. Um, any objections? The agenda is adopted. Uh, and now uh, to the minutes from last month's meeting, the September full board meeting. Any questions on the minutes? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to adopt the minutes. Motion to adopt. Thanks, Joe. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any objections on the minutes? Great, the minutes are adopted. I just wanna check, the borough president is not here yet, right? Not okay. To, not to my knowledge. Great, we're gonna dive right in and I'm gonna pass it over to Bert and Frank uh, for uh, the BLP letters. Okay, BLP, hi everyone. BLP letters, we have one through 12. If we were doing individual uh, voting, which we don't do because we do it later on, but we'd say we wanna bundle items two through 12. And I wanna to bring to people's attention item number one. Item number one is unusual because item number one is a complete denial. It's not as if we spoke with the applicant and worked out stipulations and they agreed to it. And then, you know, we deny unless the stipulations are met. No, none of that. Complete denial. The reason for that is this is not a new applicant. This applicant has been around for at least 15 years. This applicant has a history. And in, if you looked at the, um, the motion we submitted in item number one, the letter, we included um, uh, the motion, the letter 
from 2014 that this board adopted from the BLP at that time with stipulations for this applicant. So it was called, you know how they are in terms of liquor licenses, you know, they have one name and then 10 years later, it's another name, whatever. Don't be fooled by that. Um, this applicant, we accepted with stipulations and every single stipulation that they agreed to never happened. They, ne they, never, they never implemented. Oh yeah, we're gonna do it. Never happened. They have a history. They have a history over, what's my math? 2014 to 2022, that's uh, a bunch of years, right? Uh, a bunch of years, almost a decade, right? 14 plus 10, 24, almost a decade, okay? Um, they have a history of, oh yeah, oh, there's a complaint. Oh yeah, and we're sorry. We're going to uh, remedy that. Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna help the community. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do that. They never have done anything. They are. A... I don't. Sir, can we take what? the question from Paul to see if it's? Um, I just want to okay? finish my little tirade. Sure. Okay. Sorry. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's a fairly civilized tirade. Okay. It is. Thank you. Okay. I'm fairly. You know. So the bottom line is. They came to us again. Uh, there had been um, in, in scene, in, intra. The, the, some of the owners were fighting with each other. So two were bought out. So they had to come for a new license. There was nobody in the community. I want to mention that. Nobody in the community who came in favor of this applicant. And there are other there are other establishments. This is a mid-block. Mostly it's a mid-block, some commercial and a lot of residential. There are other establishments. There have not been objections as much for those establishments. They've got new licenses. And this just, by the way, is our borderland. This is on the south side of 26th Street, which is us. The north side of 26th Street, this is between 6th and 7th, is Community Board 5. This is that where that bottom of us on the L shape. Anyway, that's so that's Thanks, why Bert. it's a complete denial. Okay, Jeff. Uh, Paul? That's a great rant, Bert. Boy, you went on and on. Listen, uh, on that letter, um, are they the same people that have the shuttered Ainsworth on the corner of 45th and 9th Avenue that lost their liquor license and is now a vacant storefront that is not? being supportive of the community? And do we need to add a paragraph to this letter correlating those two? Uh, not, not quite, Paul, although this applicant was involved in that. The problem with the 45th and 9th place was the license holder, which was this place called Southern Hospitality, engaged in this process called, which is forbidden by the SLA, called the veiling. In which case, in which he let the Ainsworth operate there, but under his license. So when the SLA investigated, the only person who actually got investigated was the owner of the license, the Southern Hospital. But, but, but if Ainsworth was a party to that illegal activity of the conveyance of the license, does that need to be pointed out in the letter? And I, you, I defer to your. Yeah, I think we determined we were so strong in Chelsea that. You know, it wasn't worth the sidelight, but uh, Bert and I will talk about it and see. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Tina? Oh, great letter, guys. Um, uh, just a couple comments. Um, live music on 30 and 32. I'm not 100% that they uh, have live music, so I think it's probably just better to delete it or leave it out. And on number six, on the second page, it says 40 televisions. They recently renovated, so I'm not sure how many televisions they have. So maybe not use a, a number, but you know, many big televisions. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Thanks, Tina. And I do want to say, throw out a thank you to Christine Berset, who authored most of this letter. Thank you, Christine. That wasn't mentioned in her award. 
but she's on BOP too. Great. Uh, I want to now pause the business portion of our meeting uh, and pass it over. Our esteemed borough president has joined us, who I actually saw this morning as well. Uh, Mark Levine, I want to pass it over to you for some updates. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. It's wonderful to see you all. See, before I've had a chance to see a few of you this morning at that great event hosted by the Hudson Yards and Hell's Kitchen bid. I saw a few of you earlier in the week at a wonderful street co-naming for Jim Houghton, the founder of the Signature Theater, just an extraordinary leader for the community, also a resident of Community Board 4 lived in Manhattan Plaza. So it uh, been great to see so many of you out there. Uh, first, just want to touch on, on a procedural matter. I know you're very concerned about um, the emergency order that's allowed you to conduct your business through Zoom. And uh, as we know, once those orders are lifted, um, the state has determined that you're going to have to conduct your business in a hybrid format. Uh, we understand the complexity of that, so we're really paying close attention to the timing. The COVID emergency order has been extended again through October 21st, and there's a second overlapping order for monkeypox, believe it or not, that extends through October 26th. We do not know whether either or both of the orders will be extended beyond that. We are preparing for uh, a need to transition to, to hybrid mode for all of you and supporting you everywhere we can and getting you the legal guidance and, and the technical and staffing assistance that you need. Uh, that's the latest I have on you uh, for you, uh, a few more weeks of, of reprieve on that front. Um, I, I know that, that this community board is really um, been the center of the many of the migrants that are arriving to New York City being sent here uh, by Texas. Uh, I won't get too political, but uh, in my opinion, a profoundly cynical move by uh, the leadership in Texas. I'm really proud of the way New York City has been embracing the migrants, um, embracing them as, as New Yorkers. Uh, this is the best of the city. But we also have to be clear about the needs we have, the, the resources that we need, the funding we need from the federal government and potentially ultimately the state government uh, to help uh, offset the cost the city is incurring. Uh, there's other help we need. We need work permits for these uh, migrants. They're, they are desperate to work um, and they are they're clearly capable of doing that and they're unable to do so until they get a work permit. They're here legally, they have a right to seek a work permit, but there's a bureaucratic backlog at the Department of Homeland Services. Uh, this would be a win-win because we need more workers in so many sectors of our city and uh, from restaurants to retail. This would uh, be good for the city's economy and good for these individuals and would allow them to move out to shelter, out of shelter as they are uh, in many cases desperate to do. Uh, you've probably seen in the news cities planning on opening uh, a essentially a, a temporary receiving center on um, Randall's Island. Uh, this is in Manhattan, so something I've been very engaged in. It's controversial, I won't get into the details, um, but uh, if you've seen the operation at the bus terminal on 42nd Street, you know that it, it's not working. Uh, the number of people arriving is so great. Today, there were nine buses, that's the oh. record. We've been getting six to eight daily, uh, but nine at 50 people per bus. You're talking over 400 individuals. It's very, very difficult to process them at the bus terminal. And what we need to do is have a central location where we can provide them medical care, give them a hot meal, give them a place to take a shower, wash their clothes, um, have children be enrolled in the public schools, uh, have the families enroll in health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just not possible to do that in a, in a quick contact at the bus terminal. So we need, we need to do something better. And there are some concerns about Randall's Island, particularly the, the transit links, which are not good there, which I, which I can talk about if you want, but we're, we're, we're working on that. And of course, you know, there's also a plan to get a, a cruise ship um, uh, that would provide temporary housing uh, as well. So I can talk more about that if you want, but. Uh, I know it's very much on your mind here uh, in CB4. I think some of you know, this is not breaking news anymore, that I've I've joined with leaders like you here in CB4 and other elected officials on the west side to call for alleviating the overcrowding on the Hudson River Greenway, the most heavily used 
uh, greenway in the country. And we've called for taking a lane of the West Side Highway south of 57th Street and creating a lane that could be used for bikes, for e-bikes, uh, to clear up the congestion on the on the main greenway. Um, really, really grateful for the way CB4 has stepped up on this uh, for a long time, even prece preceding my own call. Uh, we've gotten an overwhelming positive support from community boards and elected leaders up and down the West Side. Um, now, I'm now in conversation with the uh, state leadership. Ultimately, it's their call. This is a property that is under the jurisdiction of the State Department of Transportation. Um, so we're, we're in conversations with them and I'll, I'll certainly keep you posted on that. Um, you, know, you know that I'm very active on, on health matters and uh, continue to be uh, very active on, on monkeypox, which has impacted CB4 and on, on COVID. Um, we've had a very low take up rate on the new booster for COVID. We don't actually officially have the New York number yet. The national number is 4% of those eligible have gotten this, this new booster uh, in New York City. If I had to guess, the number is probably not much better than that. Um, we, we, we need to, to increase the rate of take up. Really, if you haven't been boosted in this calendar year, then you're not up to date on your COVID vaccination. And we're coming into the winter season. It's every reason to expect we'll see cases rise again. Um, and it's just so easy and simple to get that booster. So you all are leaders in the community. You have credibility in the community. You're ambassadors for public health. I just um, hope you tell folks that it's really easy to get your shot. You can do it. Many uh, family doctors have it. Uh, hundreds of pharmacies have it. You can find out on the vaccine finder, just Google NYC vaccine finder. Um, the main public hospitals are now offering uh, it for free uh, and uh, people who are homebound have the opportunity to get uh, a clinician come to their home. Uh, so there's really, uh, there's really, it's never been easier to get your vaccine and hope you all will, will alert people to that. So I think I'm going to pause there. Uh, Mr. Chair, if there's time and it's appropriate, I'm happy to take a couple of questions. If, if your agenda is too crowded and doesn't allow it, I understand that as well. But no, I, I just, given, no, I, given the importance of your update and when the hands went up, I think it's on the topic of, um, of the asylum and migrant crisis, which right. I just want to flag for you and the board that we have um, a, a, a letter coming out of our executive committee this evening to you and all of our elected leaders uh, in government from the, you know, the federal Senate uh, to the city council, um, really reflecting what you summarized, but calling for more funding and for better communication to our community. So um, you'll be getting that soon, but I want right. to call on Sabrina uh, for a question if she has one. Sure. Hi. Um I actually myself have been volunteering uh, the last two Saturdays on uh, 42nd Street and seeing myself uh, the the crisis itself. It comes a little closer to me as I'm Venezuelan, also asylum seeker from Venezuela. For the past seven years, I've been pending asylum. So I understand the process and just to correct the work um, permits, it can take up to a year. And that's just the regulation itself. So it's a very, um, you know, and you have to renew it every two years and you have to pay up front for that. But just to not to get into the process uh, myself of, of, of how is to seek asylum in the United States. Uh, but my question to that, or I guess it's, uh, I'm curious to know if the numbers of migrants that we're having now can be compared to anything that we had uh, back into the early 1900s with Ailes Island. Because um, the way I was seeing it is like, and you, you allude to this, is like the operation that it needs to be happen in this. It's so high, and um, and I'm just curious to see if like, well, one, what are the numbers? If this comparable to what we had uh, back in the Ellis Island days, I know it closed out in 1956. So obviously we. I don't know if we can measure those numbers with the numbers that we have now, but um, if we can model or if, if this is going to continue or there's something that we can at least look into or consider to, to have something like uh, what Ellis Island had. Well, Sabrina, thank you for what you're doing to support uh, those who are being sent here. Uh, it makes me feel really proud to hear New Yorkers like you who are, who are there for, for these families who have been through so much. So thank you for that. 
Um, my understanding, uh, I'm not, not a historian, but that in the peak years of the Ellis Island arrivals, we were getting several thousand people arriving a day. So we're, we're not yet at that level. Uh, but, um, you know, th this is, go I think ahead. It's seven, I'm sorry, 7,000 a month, something like that. Oh, I, I, during, during Ellis Island days, I think. It no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. Currently. Right. Yes, exactly. So, so this is not at the scale of, of Ellis Island, although uh, we're, we, we are, we are seeing an increase and we expect it to continue uh, for very cynical reasons. I expect it to continue through the November 8th election. I think, I think it's, it's a given that that will happen. Hard to predict beyond that. Uh, but, you know, Governor Abbott has decided that this is uh, a winning political issue for him. I mean, it, it, th there's just no doubt that he's not doing this with the interest of, of, of these human beings in mind. Uh, among other things, there are um, many people who are being sent to New York who have family in other parts of the country. Uh, it makes no sense that they're coming here. Uh, I know of at least one case where the individual had family in another part of Texas and wanted to go to San Antonio. And then plenty uh, of them are going back to Texas, Florida, other states. Who are going exactly. To so it's, it's really outrageous. And, and, and just to remind people, we have no coordination. It's, we have no heads up about uh, the arrivals. Uh, we are relying essentially on insider tips uh, to know that we need to have resources there at the bus terminal to receive people, which is just the, the, the ultimate proof that Governor Abbott has no interest in the welfare of these human beings uh, or the minimum decency would stipulate that he would coordinate with us. So uh, we, we expect it to continue and, and New York is going to do right by them. And I, I'm proud of that, but it's a challenge and we need help. We need more federal assistance, financial assistance. We need to expedite work permits and we need national coordination. Um, but in the meantime, uh, New York is going to continue to step up. Thank you. Uh, and if I could just add to that before we go to Mike for the next question, um, in particular, uh, Borough President, on the super local level, Ryan Health Center, which is a, a health, health clinic on 10th Avenue in the 40s, um, we've heard from them that they've, you know, seen a significant increase uh, in, in demand locally, while Bellevue we recognize as a first stop, the follow-up care and conditions that arise once folks have arrived, and those that have settled in Hell's Kitchen based on the shelters that we have, you know, we're seeing a real strain on the local clinics. And then likewise at PS 111 um, made, you know, soaring enrollment and not a matching in terms of resources for supplies, meals, and of course, multilingual uh, teachers and, and just assistants at the school as well. So, and, and, I, and I was at PS, I was at PS 111 and I was in a class with 38 students and about 15 of them were migrant children. Uh, it's unacceptable. We need more personnel in the schools. Uh, teachers, but more than that, we also need uh, guidance counselors or social workers yeah. uh, because these, these children have been through trauma that it's, it's almost difficult to talk about, uh, but it's, it's, it's horrifying to hear what they've experienced uh, either in their home country or in their transit to the U.S. And we need to provide them care and we don't have adequate Staffing, especially not adequate bilingual staffing. I was bilingual, speaking to, yeah. I was speaking to Michael Mulgrew, the head of the teachers union, tonight about this exact issue. They're pushing. Uh, we have to do better with resourcing the schools. PS 111 probably being the most significant uh, situation of overcrowding that I know of. I want to go to uh, Mike Noble for the next question, which was going to be our last, David. So if you'll uh, just to respect everybody's time this evening, Mike, I'm going to pass it to you. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm interested to, you know, back when uh, we had uh, people coming to uh, your apartment to do a COVID test, right? Yeah. Which was a great thing. And it, it turned out that that person uh, determined that I did indeed have COVID. So it was a, a wonderful uh, way to get that done. And I wonder now, how does one go about getting this booster shot at home? Yes, they need to. the city has a wonderful program and anyone who is uh, homebound due to uh, medical condition or disability or anyone who is 65 period uh, and older is eligible. So that's a pretty large percentage of, of New Yorkers. Uh, and um, there, there's just a way to request an appointment uh, they send a team out 
And by the way, while they're in your apartment, they will vaccinate any other members of the household. Uh, so that could be a caregiver. doesn't matter whether they themselves uh, are homebound, obviously, or whether they're over 65. could be a family member, uh, even a young person. Uh, uh, I, I don't know the best way to get you the link. I, I've tweeted it out many times. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll get it to Chair LeFrancois, um, and you can pass it on to to your members. Uh, it's just a very simple form. Yeah, it's a very simple form that you fill out. Um, and they call you and schedule a visit. Great. Oh, you can't put it in Thanks, the chat right. then now, huh? Uh, no, I, we'll, I um, we if the chat's go. open, I'll do we it do now. No, we do not have the chat function, but Mike, we will circulate oh, that yeah. to you guys um, in due order. That's obviously an important one and a really great resource for the community. So happy to, to circulate that. Um, thank you. President Levine, thank you very much. Uh, thank for you, your everybody. And for joining us this evening. Have a great night. Thanks. Be well. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, back to our agenda um, is my, my damn tabs, pardon me. Um, I believe it's Chelsea Landjuice and Carrie and Jessica are both not with us this evening. And so I'm, I can't remember who on the committee was designated as presenter. Uh, Jesse, um, as you're eating know. dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I don't, I'm not trying to make everybody jealous. Um, David uh, Holoka is gonna represent. David work on two of the letters and I believe Viren, I believe is gonna speak uh, or, or Paul may be speaking on the other letter up to uh, around 675. Great, so let's take, um, let's see. Why David, you're first. first? It's oh, sorry, items, I'm guessing David, you'll be speaking to the letters to LPC, item 13 and 14? Yes. Okay, why don't you take those up first? Okay, um, actually, Jesse, I don't know if you could screen share at this point. <clears throat> They're both regarding uh, the former Bayview Correctional Facility, which was built as uh, the Siemens House YMCA. Um, and it was originally designed by Shreve Lam and Harmon, the architects of the Empire State Building. It was in construction at the same time as the Empire State Building. It's kind of an easy building to overlook. It's at the southeast corner of 20th Street and the West Side Highway, and um, uh, it has these very prominent uh, terracotta designs at the top, the heads of uh, the top floor windows. Uh, and all of those, except for six of them, have been removed. I happen to notice this walking past. Unfortunately, 22 of them have been removed. Uh, and the building really embodies um, Chelsea's waterfront from a time when it was the heart of the Port of New York and the Port of New York was the, probably the busiest port in the world. Um, and two other buildings from this era have already been designated landmarks. One is the Jane Hotel at Jane uh, Street and the West Side Highway. The other is the Keller Hotel at 150 Barrow Street. They were likewise both built as institutions serving seamen. That's their cultural significance. And they are no more architecturally significant. So this building certainly merits designation. And we asked the Landmarks Commission nine years ago uh, to designate the building. They never got back to us until three and a half years ago just to say, yeah, we're working on it. Uh, the state bought the building in 1966, converted it into Bayview uh, after Sandy. They emptied it out. Uh, we were afraid that it was going to be sold into private hands. That's why we asked for landmark designation. Uh, you may remember that for a time it was going to be the women's building. The plan now is for it to become supportive housing. It's still owned by the state and overseen by Empire State Development and uh, the Office of General Services, which is managing the construction. So when I saw that these elements were missing, I called the State Historic Preservation Office, which is called SHPO, <clears throat> or known as SHPO, and asked if they knew about it and was kind of shocked to find out that they didn't. And because the building is eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places, ESD and OGS ought to have contacted SHPO and gotten them to be involved uh, they responded that it was a, a threat to the public because pieces were falling on the sidewalk, which I don't buy because the first thing you do is put up a sidewalk. Shed, David, which gets rid I just want to, this is, this is all very, you've outlined exactly what is in the letter. So um, okay. I just well, want to, then I'll update a bit and say that, uh, that OGS and ESD are telling Chippo that they have stockpiled the removed tiles 
for restoration and reinstallation by the future tenant. Uh, I don't know that, uh, that that's the case. SHPO hasn't seen them yet. That's why we're asking to see them. You would think that OGS and ESD would be anxious to show that they have done that. And we would also like a meeting. And our, our uh, letter is asking for confirmation around that and to make sure right, that we're correcting to, to the meet, wrongs. To look at it. the stored tiles and also to find out how they plan to ensure that the tenant will, with proper oversight and involvement of a preservationist, reinstall the tiles or replicate them and reinstall them. This is obviously a big oops. And I think that it's an opportunity for us to put pressure on both OGS to do the right thing and all landmarks right. to all of, all of which is in the letter. So this, I just, I just want to be happened if, if it were designated as it should be. Great. Uh, item 14, 675. Oh, Joe has a question. Uh, just a quick note in the letter, David, could we also add that they put in writing where they're being stored. So we have it on record. That's how we were able to preserve the cow heads from the slaughterhouse because we knew exactly where they were. And if this happens over time, they could be moved and we'll lose track of them, even though they, they, they say they have them. Right, sounds like a good idea to me. Roberta? I had a question on um, item 14 and I don't, uh, David, you might- Let's get to 14 then. Um, yeah, yeah. Sure. Summary on 14, David? Um, it's really actually, that's pretty yeah, much. I'm, I'm gonna present 14, the 675 Avenue of the Matter Cards. Uh, the letter is pretty straightforward. They're asking for five planters to be placed on the sidewalk. Um, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, you wanna say something? That's, that's, that's 13. 13. No, that's 15. Uh, folks, if everybody could hold on a second. I apologize, I messed up the order here. Um, Roberta, is your question about Bayview or is it about 675 Sixth Avenue? It's about Bayview. Got it. So the floor is yours for the question on Bayview, please. Appreciate it. I hey. took a look at the 2013-2014 uh, uh, request from the board um, that was submitted and I wasn't able to figure out would this uh, request harm or make it more difficult to turn the facility into social services or supportive housing in any way? Okay. I would I say that it, it should not at all. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, the, the burning issue right now is it's relatively cosmetic to the interior. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's quite important uh, architecturally. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for that, Roberta. And to David. Um, okay, now to Viren for item 13, which I flopped, and so that is um, up next. No, um, Joe had a question. 14. I'm sorry. Joe had a question. Could, Christine, is your question on on Bayview? No, I'm pointing out that Joe has his... Oh, Joe, I think, did Joe already asked his question? No, this is just for Roberta. Roberta would add a source of financing for the affordable housing, historic preservation tax credits. So it actually benefit the project for financing. Well, at the state level, not at, at the LPC level, right? It, either, it, it really either? doesn't matter. Okay. Either, either okay. we do it. Either. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Should okay, Biren, go, go ahead, the floor is yours. All right, the application is for addition, uh, addition of five planters to be placed in front of the um, Taylor Joe's 6th Avenue, 675. Um, and the size of planters is determined by the by DOT and the owner of the reports have, been, have selected locations to comply with the DOT guidance. However, the application is for LPC consideration. And if uh, we also have a little note from LPC, which says when a planter is large enough to warrant a public hearing, elements such as size, spacing, aesthetics, and how it fits into the overall context of the neighborhood are all taken into consideration. Also, for this particular item, weighing an application's appropriateness is more focused on streetscape rather than building and rather than LPC matter. So the committee decided to um, deny this, and I think that they're also going to present this proposal to transportation committee regarding the streetscape. And um, that's where the let letter is. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to sort of answer them on behalf of Kerry. 
Thanks, Viren. Uh, any questions on item 13 regarding 675 Avenue of the Americas? Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, item 15 um, regarding Bayview. Who was this one? It was, um, all, it was all David, but I think honestly, David, unless we just it, those were kind of lumped into the same, right there, David. The, right, one letter one is to OGS saying, "Show us the tiles," and Got you it. know, what's your plan? The other is to LPC saying, where's, "Where's your response to our nine-year-old request for evaluation?" Perfect. Thank you for that. So, a state and a city letter. Any yes. questions on the Chelsea land use letters? Okay. Thank you to the stand-ins this evening. Appreciate it. Um, on to ACES. Alan and Kit, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. These are easy, no confusion here. Um, want to thank Tamara for the Fountain House letter. I don't think she's uh, here this evening. So for those of you who don't know Fountain House, which is on 9th and 47, it's a uh, nonprofit uh, mental health organization um, working to increase opportunity and also um, in social and economic isolation of folks with mental illness. And one of their more successful programs is their Fountain House Gallery with a studio in Long Island City and a gallery on the corner of Ninth Avenue. Um, so we're here to support them. Um, the gallery um, offers a creativity space in the studios and helps to support the uh, artists uh, by selling their work and sharing the proceeds. Um, just as, a, as, as an aside, uh, they are looking for space on the west side. They're trying to move out of Long Island City. So if anybody has a connection to some space, uh, Rachel Weissman at the Fountain House is um, looking for uh, appropriate space for this. So you can contact her directly. Thanks, Alan. Betty has a question on the Fountain House letter. Yes, um, thank you, and I, I really support the gist of this letter. I was wondering, this one and the next one uh, after this, is it at all appropriate to say how much money, how much funding that one would like to have for any of these projects? Uh, we really didn't get into the financials on this, Betty, um, and that we will be supporting them hopefully through our um, um, statement of district needs to the cultural affairs. Um, and uh, in reference to the, uh, well, that will be taken up on the other letter. Um, yeah. When do you yeah. take that? Okay. Thanks, Betty. Uh, next letter, Alan. Uh, thank you again, Chair. I'd like to turn this over to Wendy, who uh, drafted this letter. Perfect. So this letter is fairly straightforward. I think most of you all are familiar with Katie Savage and the Litter Legion, but it's an organization that was founded in 2020 in response to a decreased uh, basket pickup service uh, for trash and just a general increase in trash that was observed in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood. Since then, the letter <laughs> um, includes some of the statistics around the impact that they've had, but um, they've done really incredible work, very inspiring work for um, grassroots efforts to make our community cleaner and um, safer. Um, all of that has been funded by community donations up till now, but they now have a 501c3 designation and so are eligible for discretionary funding. So the letter is in support of that request for council member Eric Botcher's office. And then as Alan mentioned in our statement of district needs, we'll also share our support there and Betty, um, I received your uh, friendly amendments with the recommendation regarding um, the dollar amount. So I'll reach out to Katie to see if she has a target dollar amount. Um, and then you, I know you had another recommendation around including a little description of what's included in the cleanup kits. So I'll see if I can get a little detail there. And then I saw that you had a little uh, language um, for lines, I think 38 and 39, just to add um, a little, just make a little change there. So will very happily incorporate those friendly amendments and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. And wait a minute, are you saying that Betty had copy edits on a letter? That's just amazing. Um, I, any questions for Wendy on the Litter Legion letter? 
Okay, thank you, Asis. Moving on to transportation, Christine and Dale, please. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Yes, we, um, so this month we heard of the MTA who is building a, who is going to build a, tra uh, a, a electric uh, transit station in on 28th street in the uh, middle of uh, Penn South. So it's between uh, nine and eight. And um, uh, I mean, I hope you have read the letter which has a lot of details. Uh, essentially the situation is that the MTA is moving on. The governor has written a letter saying, this is good, I support that. And the RFP has gone out and will be uh, awarded at the end of this month and they will proceed with that. So it's quote unquote, a little bit of a done deal. So we have identified those items which we we felt they had not done the proper um, uh, due diligence. Last, there is another uh, site that they could have explored uh, their Environmental due diligence were not published, but they published it today, a little bit late. Uh, it seems that they need to have a special permit um, in the zoning text. And, but it seems also that they have done, uh, you know, build about 230 of those without a BSA. So, I mean, at this point, it's pretty obvious that it's kind of grandfathered. And the most thing that I'm very concerned, we are very concerned about is that the preventive program to mitigate construction noise has not been provided. They just think it's business as usual. And we think that in the middle of Penn South where it's very quiet and a lot of people are living, you know, are they in the apartment eight hours a day, it's going to be a real problem, especially for about nine months of construction. Now, uh, so we we are we have asked them to do a, a better job. They have essentially uh, said, "Well, you know, we'll follow all the procedures." And uh, so we are just saying, "Look, this is these are the issues, and um, and and we um, and and I think we should do um, we you should address those issues since we are not being okay. asked to approve essentially." And, and then the uh, Betty obviously has a lot of small items and we will integrate that. I also want to commend um, Christine and Dale for the committee that meeting that they ran, which had 150 plus uh, attendees um, and which is, you know, not simple for anybody. So um, kudos on managing that. Uh, Betty. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Christine and Dale. Um, and I, I won't go over the picky edit kind of stuff, but um, I am very concerned about the noise. Uh, for full expo explanation, I live right next to this. And um, so I would appreciate you guys who are more familiar with the um, MTA and what they do, if you could keep on top of it and let us know. I, you didn't quite mention that all those people who came were mainly Penn South people and they were vehemently opposed to this project. I think some some of their their issues were moot, but the construction and the noise part problem, I think, can be significant. So whenever you you know, yeah, well, well, I mean, we tried. I went to visit. I we told them, TA, this is what other people have done. This is, they use a cocoon. They do this, they do that. And they came back and they said, no, we are just going to comply. So I fully expect that they are going to start working. And after two days, we are going to have, you know, a semi riot, and uh, but we'll ask we'll ask MTA to bring back the con the construct the you know the construction company once they have a contract, and then you know sit down with them and see whether we can you know influence them into uh, providing additional uh, protection, and so that's it. 
Yeah, I, I, I went to the presentation by the MTA, and at one point, I do believe they said that they might or would put noise uh, machines in people's apartments to see what the noise level would be. No. So, I no, what they did, what they said, we asked that question specifically, and what they said is like, if there is a problem, then we will put a uh, measurement. Oh. Right. I guess it's typical. typical. We kind of want it the op. We want to. We, right. we do it only. We don't even want to get that far. We know that jackhammers right. and concrete saws right. make noise, and so the advanced mitigation is really what we're seeking. Right. So what's that's uh, you know we'll we'll invite them for we'll invite the contractor and we'll see what they say and then we'll raise the issue again and so we'll be on the top of it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm happy about that. Thanks, Betty. And again, to Christine and Dale. Um, any other questions on that letter? Okay, uh, we tabled item 19. That will be back on the docket in November. Thank you, Maria and Joe, on that. Um, up next, out of the Executive Committee, as I mentioned, item 20 um, is a letter to our elected representatives regarding the unfolding asylum-seeking crisis, uh, really taking place literally in our backyard uh, at our Executive Committee meeting. We invited members um, from the mayor's office. Uh, we had somebody from the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, as well as somebody from HHC, talk to us about this. This came about because we learned about the Red Cross Resource Center in the press. Uh, and so number one, we wanna make sure we don't learn about things in the press uh, as it relates to stuff happening in our district going forward. And of course, number, number two, really wanna be advocating for as much resources as possible, not just for the city, on the whole, but also super, super locally, as I mentioned, for places like the Ryan Center and PS 111. Uh, I received a couple of copy edits uh, for the letter. Happy to incorporate that. And I see some hands going up. Thank you for those. Mr. Devlin, you're up first. Uh, just a quick additional edit, Jeffrey, based on uh, Borough President Levine's comments that we had and support staff to the school funding teachers and support staff on both of them. I'll, I'll I like that. Email on that. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Katie? On a related note, also about PS 111, he mentioned a specific number, you know, that he saw a classroom with 38 students, which is beyond union contract too. So maybe if we could just add on that second page um, about line 12, something about the specific numbers in the classroom. Did you say it's beyond contract? Well, so the, yeah, I mean, yeah, we don't have to it. mention the contract if we don't want to with the um, the teachers union, but they're not supposed to have you know, more than a certain exactly. number in each classroom. Um, Got it. And then back to what Paul just said, if we can, you know, um, the Manhattan Borough President also mentioned um, social workers. And if we can specifically reference that, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Joe. Yeah, it's actually bilingual social workers that PS 111 needs, but they're also need, they have to put in PS 51 because what's happened is the overflow is so heavy in PS 111 kids are being transferred to PS 51 and they also need bilingual social workers. You can't just move kids around without services going with them. So make sure we hit both schools in there. Absolutely. Uh, PS 111 was included because we talked about it exact, but obviously 51, we could have predicted that was gonna happen. Any other, Aurora, hi. Hey, Jeffrey. Um, eventually we're going to have to hit our middle schools in district two as well, because kids aren't just going to middle, uh, elementary schools. They'll be going to our middle schools as well. That's fair. Thank you. I will appropriately, um, acknowledge, uh, and reword accordingly. Thank you for that. Any other questions on item 20? Okay. Uh, new business item 21 back to transportation. Yes, it's a very simple letter. There was a long distance bus stop, intercity long distance bus stop at 36 and uh, 11. Uh, during COVID, they, it was for Bolt bus. During COVID, it was vacated. And now a company from uh, Massachusetts is asking to use that stop with many, many less uh, trips. And so it's a, it's a no-brainer. Great, thank you, Christine. Any questions on the new, item, new business item? Okay, 
Uh, time now to pass it over uh, to our co-secretaries to call the roll and run the vote. No ULERPs this evening, so a straightforward uh, singular vote for everybody. Katie and Blake? Yep, I'm going to pull up everybody's names here. I know it was just, hold on, I want to do this in order. Give me a sec, and then I'll be ready for you. And so just to be clear, you're saying that, yeah, we don't have to do anything first or anything separate. Is that right, Jeffrey? That is correct. A very simple, straightforward um, question on the votes. Nothing separate this evening. Okay. And Jesse, you sent me the list again. Oh, yeah, the vote sheet is your... Oh, no. Janine, Janine would have sent it to you Oh, earlier. yeah, Janine sent it. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay. Yep. Jeffrey, you Hold went on. so quickly. Okay. That, um... I know, Katie. Hold on one second. A question from Roberta. Uh, could you just confirm what you would like us to mark 19 as? Tabled. Tabled. Thank you. Sorry. That's an excellent question. So, so yeah. item 19 on your vote sheet, it was tabled. Please mark it as such. Jesse, can you send out a vote sheet again? I can't locate mine. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Are we ready? Katie? Okay. Ted? Yes to all. Thank you. Roberta? Yes to all. Christine, our heroine this evening. <laughs> yes to all, and I sent my uh, survey. Gwen? Yes to all. Thank you. Leslie? Yes to all. Viren? Yes to all. Jessica's not here. Dale? Yes to all. <clears throat> Aurora? Yes to all. Martin? I don't believe Marty's, Marty's not here tonight. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Paul? Sorry, yes to all. Thank you. Tina? Yes to all. Pete? Uh, yes to all and yeah. submitted. Thank you, Pete. Wendy? Yes to all and submitted. Matt? Yes to all. Thank you. Jesse? Green yes to all. And thank you for all the letter writers. Very true. Candace? Yes to all submitted. Thank you. David Haluka? Yes to all. Frank? Yes to all. Josephine? Yes to all. Yadira? Yes to all, submitted. Thank you. Peggy? Peggy is not here this evening. All right, and I think you said Carrie's not here this evening either, right? Yes. Correct. Yep. Uh, okay, Lowell? Yes to all. Blake. Yes to all. Bert. Yes to all. Christopher. Not here. Okay. Betty. Yes to all. Sarah. No. Tina nope. Nelson. Hi, Katie. I hate to break the chain, but I think I have to abstain to 20. But yes to all, all of the rest. Thank you. <laughs> no apology <laughs> necessary. Thanks, Tina. <laughs> Mike Noble. Yes to all and submitted. Thank you. JD, were you here? No, he's not no. making time. Right. Okay. Maria. Hey Katie, um, yes to all, but I need to do P and E for number twenty. P and E, okay. Uh, Alan, yes to all. Thank you, Brad. Yes to all. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Yes to all and submitted. Great, Sabrina. P and E on seventeen. And 20 and the rest, yes. Thank you. Got it. Dolores? She's not here. Okay, thank you. 
David Solnick. Yes to all. Thanks. Me, yes to all. Uh, Charles. Uh, PE on 17, yes to the rest. Okay, and Charles, just to confirm, that's PE just on 17, is that right? Correct. PE on number 17, yes to the rest. Okay, thank you. Kit. Not yet tonight. Okay. Hector. I didn't see Hector tonight, I don't think. No, All right. Okay. Marino. Yes, and all submitted. Wow, very good. James. Yes to all submitted and all due respect to Barry Bonds. Aaron Judge is the home run king. <laughs> I always David, wait for it. Every month I wait for it. <laughs> David Warren. See David either. Yeah, okay. no. Leslie Williams. Yes to all. Thank you. Yep. Carl. Yes to all. Alice. I am P and E on number 20 and then yes to all. Okay. And then last but not least, our esteemed leader, Jeffrey. Thanks, Katie. Uh, yes on all, easy for me this month too. Um, uh, Tina, you had your hand for a question? Yeah, I think I should, I should have um, voted P and E versus um, abstention. Yes. Yeah. Sure. If it's a, like, if it's a, it's a, a professional conflict, that is the, that's the yeah. way to go. So per okay. present, not eligible in item 20 for you. Thank you. Perfect. Glad you uh, clarified. Got it. Okay. Um, just a, a re pleasant reminder about those committees that change in the month of head to review the calendar, which is properly reflected on our website. Uh, and I think that's it, right? So I will entertain a, a motion to adjourn, please. So moved. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Enjoy the Bye, weather. Guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.